If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Our guest today is Jason Irwin. Now, Jason's actually co-hosting with his wife on The Horse Trainer, which is a show on the Cowboy Channel. But before we start talking to Jason, I want to remind you that the podcast is brought to you by International Horse College, and the mission of International Horse College is to improve the welfare of horses around the world through the safe education of riders, handlers, and trainers. Have a look at the wide variety of horse courses now at internationalhorsecollege.com. And just have a chat to the friendly staff as well. Registered training organisation number 31352. Now, welcome, Jason. How are you? Oh, I'm terrific. How are you doing? Yeah, look, I'm excited to talk to you about, you know, being co-host with your wife on the horse trainer. But before we even start that, Jason, have you got a favourite quote that you'd like to tell us about? You know, a quote that, you know, has inspired you or it could even be something that you find yourself teaching people again and again and again because it's important to you. And just tell us about how it's inspired you or influenced your life with horses. Uh well, I, I'm going to throw out two of them, I guess. Uh, my favorite line, I got it from the movie Lonesome Dove, was better to have it and not need it than, and to, than to need it and not have it. And that, uh, and uh, I think anyone that's ever seen me pack up for a horse expo understands that. I think I bring more tack and more equipment and everything that I could ever need in a thousand years <laughs> and that uh, and never use any of it. But uh, And then within the horse training realm, I guess you could say, probably the saying that I've heard that makes the most sense is uh, make the right thing easy and the wrong thing difficult. And uh, I think that's probably the truest thing in horses. If you can find a way to make something easy for the horse, they'll probably do it. And I I think that's a pretty good quote for a person to always keep in the back of their mind when they're working with horses. Yeah, yeah. It's one that we've heard before, but I think it's just so basic, isn't it? It's just so basic that the horse really understands what the training's about because if the horse doesn't understand what the training's about, It's not really training. and You want the horse to um, be happy in their training and understand what you're asking of them rather than it all being fear-based. Oh, definitely. And it's one of those quotes that I don't know if it can be improved upon. uh, It's one of those ones everybody's probably heard a million times, uh, but I think it's probably the truest one that I know. Yep. Now, you know, you're talking about going off and going to a show and everything, but the show that I really want to talk to you about is The Horse Trainer. How did this come about? It's something that you do with your wife, you know, so obviously your wife is with you in your training business and a horse person herself. But just tell us a little bit about what you were doing beforehand and how, you know, what birthed the horse trainer? Well, that's a really, really long story, but I'll try to give you the short version of it. Uh, We've been involved in horses for a long time. Uh, My parents and my younger brother and I were all involved in an operation called North Star Livestock, which... Uh, we raise quarter horses and we train a lot of horses and things like that. And then uh, my wife and I, we do a lot of clinics and we teach a lot of folks at clinics, mostly in Canada. But then in the last couple of years, that's been branching out and going to the USA more. And uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, we can move out of North America as well and uh, go farther afield and teach clinics. But then just as our clinic business got bigger and bigger and we got going to some of the big horse expos, uh, we always kind of had in mind that we would like to have a TV show. And then uh, a couple of the stations out of the USA that uh, broadcast in the U.S. were coming to Canada and they wanted to get somebody on there that was Canadian uh, for the Canadian audience as well. So and uh, anyways, we end up making a deal, and we got on the RFD TV and the Cowboy Channel, the two Canadian versions. So it, we kind of we created quite a bit of work for ourselves in a pretty short frame of time, though, because we were going back and forth, and we were trying to put together a deal earlier in the year. And then, of course, with COVID and all the things in the world, everything got postponed, just like it did for everybody else. So we finally end up putting together a deal kind of late in the year. But then that only gave us a few months worth of filming to get a a year's worth of work done in about three months. So we were really hustling, trying to get that all put together. And then uh, we were asked to send in a pilot episode just so the folks could get a look at it and see if that's what they wanted. So we did that. 
And they looked at it and they said, oh, that's really good, but it suits the one station a little bit more than the other because the other station was a little bit more um, sports-oriented, like Western sports-oriented, like rodeo and things like that. So anyways, my wife, she came up with the idea, well, what if we also put together a couple series that could run on the other channel that would be a little bit more competitive, like here's how to teach a barrel horse or a pole bending horse, or here's how to start colts and things like that. So anyways, uh, we floated the idea by them and they said, oh, that's great. We'll do that too. And on the one hand, we were like, oh, that's, that's terrific. On the other hand, we're like, oh, great. We just put the, we just volunteered to do another whole show. <laughs> and that, so we had to do nearly two years worth of filming in about two months. But uh, we're just wrapping up the last of it now. So we're, We've enjoyed the process, but I'm sure happy to see some light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> All right. Now, just go over this, though, because I thought it was the horse trainer on the Cowboy Channel. What's the name of the other show and what's the other channel? Uh, well, it's still called The Horse Trainers, uh, but some of the episodes appear on the Cowboy Channel Canada and some of them appear on RFB TV Canada. What is it, RFB TV? Okay, just writing this down just to make sure I've got the story straight, you know, just want to um, make sure it's okay. Now, I'm just thinking because, you know, your wife, uh, Bronwyn's involved with you in the business, okay, and it, it's tricky, you know, having a marriage, having people working with you. Just give us a little bit of a rundown, you know, how you actually met and what made it a decision that you were going to be partnerships within the business. Well, I kind of ended up with my wife in a horse trade, if I'm being completely honest, uh, what happened was uh, she phoned me one day and we had never met and she phoned about a black mare that we had for sale. So anyways, uh, she phoned once or twice that day. I had to check something and answer a few questions. But anyways, she ended up buying the horse off me that day over the phone. And then uh, she lives in Ontario, Canada as well, but she lived about six or seven hours away from me. So she hired a trucker to haul the horse to her and that was all fine. And then uh, she had the horse for just a very short length of time, like a week and a half or two weeks or something. And then uh, it was killed by a cougar, or I don't know if you guys have them down there, but they're a mountain lion. And uh, but anyway, yeah, you don't want them either. And that, but uh, the the mayor was, uh, I say, killed not too long after that. And then she was obviously heartbroken about that. And then uh, maybe a month or two later, she ended up. Uh, coming to the farm here with her sister to see about getting another horse. And then we met then, and uh, she didn't buy a horse that day, but she bought the horse that she looked at a couple weeks later from us. And uh, so anyways, but then we were kind of talking back and forth quite a bit. And then what we have here, it's called the Royal uh, Winter Fair in Toronto every year. And that's kind of like the biggest agricultural event. And then so we went on our first date to that. And then in the process of while we were going out, I think she bought four or five horses from me. So I thought thought I was really being clever. I got the girl and sold her all the horses, but then we got married and I got her all the horses back. I <laughs> got her. So that kind of, it, it's sort of touch and go who kind of, who, who was the smarter one in that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does it work then? You know, she's obviously a horse person then, which, you know, it, it's perfect, but do you have, has she got sort of one way that she trains and not the same way as you, or is she at a level where she's just happy to, I mean, sometimes two people can be on the same path, but they're still a little different within their training methods. How does that work? Well, for us, it's actually been almost as good as I feel it can get in that regard, because she came from an English background and then changed to a Western rider. And then I have more of a more of a Western background, so she did have a slightly different perspective on it. So I would say when we got together, we probably looked fairly different in the way that we trained, although we sort of had the same principles and the same ideas. But then we were kind of taking hints and tips from each other as well. And our program now, I think, I'm sure we both have a slightly different twist on it, but it looks pretty close to the same. Um, but I definitely think, think that her coming from that English background did definitely bring more into the program. Um, so I'm, I've been very happy about that part of it. Uh, and then of course too, like people learn better from different people. So I could maybe explain something to somebody and they would sort of get it. And then she could come along and tell them here the same thing, but at different words, but maybe they would understand it better coming from her and maybe vice versa the other way around. 
So I, it works pretty well. Like I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Okay. And was she working professionally in the industry before, uh, beforehand or not? Uh, yes and no. She was actually a radiation therapist and treated cancer patients. And uh, riding was something she did. I, I'm going to say on the side, but that isn't a strong enough way to put it. She owned about four horses that she rode every day, and she showed in a lot of different events and things like that. So I, she didn't make her living with horses, but she was very, very much a part of the horse business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If someone's coming, say they've come from a non-horse background family, but they've ridden, they've had horses, they're, you know, really focused, really keen to work in the horse industry. What would you say that, you know, how, what sort of direction would you give them? Where would you say that they need to get started? What sort of advice would you give someone who's just starting with horses? Just starting, no, not just starting with horses, but just starting to break into the, I want to do this professionally. Mm -hmm. Well, my background, it's a little bit different now. You've with my parents there, like they are part of it. Um, now, I almost have to tell you my background real quick for the next part to make sense. When when I started, I am more self-taught. Like my parents were uh, livestock people and farmers, and then we had horses and then raised some horses. But I was always a little bit more interested in the training end of things. So I started uh, my first colt when I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And then I was constantly um, always watching videos or DVDs and reading books and experimenting and a lot of that stuff. But we had cattle and we had horses. And then at one point in Canada, there was an outbreak of this uh, mad cow disease, BSE. So our cattle really weren't worth anything. So we expanded on the horse end of things because we were busier there. But we really jumped into the deep end of the pool on that because... Um, again, we're in Ontario, Canada, but my dad and I, we were running steadily to the southern and the western USA, and then we would buy a load of horses, and then we'd bring them home, and then mostly I would do the training, although my younger brother definitely did a lot too, but we would train them and then sell them, and then we would go buy another load of horses, and then we would train them and sell them, and we really, that was probably uh, as much of a trial by fire as a person could get as far as being a trainer, because we didn't have the option of saying, oh, this horse, um, it's not quite suited, take it home to the owner or something like that, because we were the ones that owned them. And that, so we really, I really had to get pretty good at finding a way to get along with every horse. So I needed to have a, quite a few different tactics. I needed to come at it from different angles. I needed to learn how to get the feel of a lot of different horses fairly quickly. So my background, uh, it's a lot of, a lot of it's self-taught, a lot of it's studying other people from afar, and then a lot of it is uh, experimenting and then figuring out what works. Now, if I, how this ties in maybe to your next point is when you said, what advice do I give to other people? My way, I think, was probably about as hard a way as a person could get because it was just a lot of it, like I would maybe get into trouble with a horse and it would maybe take me two weeks to figure out how to fix a problem that if somebody more experienced was standing there, they could have told me how to fix it in maybe five minutes. So uh, having that person that can kind of keep an eye on you and direct you, I think definitely makes things easier. Now, for me, it's worked out pretty good because now I kind of have maybe a little bit more feeling for people that are frustrated and don't know what to do next with their horses. And I've experimented with so many different things that in the clinic business, this helps me a lot now. So my background really, it, it, I'm, I wouldn't trade it off for anything in the world. But if I was giving somebody else advice, I would say you would probably get a lot farther, a lot faster going to a trainer that you really like and you would like to uh, know their program, learn that program, then do a little bit more experimenting. If you sort of have that base and that foundation to fall back on, um, I think you're going to go farther faster. And I know not too long ago, I was talking to another clinician about this and he kind of come from my background with all over the place. And he said the same thing. He's like, I feel that I did it the hard way. And he's like, it, it's fine if you want to teach yourself, but like get the hard road to hold. Yeah, yeah. So that whole trainer, mentor, coach background, going to someone there is really the best way. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. Well, I think it's, I think it's probably the, I won't say the easiest, but I think it's the one where you're more likely to be successful. Having said that, 
I do think once a person goes so far in it, I think then you do maybe want to branch off a little bit and start learning from a lot of people because I have seen folks that have come out of what I would call sort of a, a cookie cutter program and they're all going to be the same. And I find they don't tend to go quite as far because they don't ever get any better than the person they studied under. I think you'd always need to be sort of looking out a little bit and always try to mix a little something into your program. And anybody that sort of always wants to learn more about horses, I think is always going to do better because anyone that feels they now know it all, I think you're going to stop pretty quick in this industry. I think there's always something else you can be learning. Yeah, yeah. And I think also too, you know, you learn how to cope with one horse, but it's then the next horse is different and the next horse is different and the next horse is different. So um, having that variety of horses coming in, you know, variety of coaches and or mentors or trainers and teaching methods, but the variety of, um, I suppose, horses that you work with and people that you work with, it's all experience, isn't it? Oh, for sure. A lot of times you could have a horse and if you just kind of approach the lesson in just a slightly different way, it'll make all the difference in the world. And then uh, it's exactly what you said with people. When I first became a clinician, I'd already trained an awful lot of horses, but then I kind of had to go back over my program and sort of round off the edges to make it a little more teachable to people now. So like sometimes I would use a technique that worked really well, but it would maybe be a technique that was really hard to explain or hard to get the point across to somebody so I would have to go back and think, okay, how could I change that same exercise around to make it just a little bit easier to comprehend or maybe make it where if a rider maybe isn't quite as experienced, they could still get the job done. And uh, I guess I, I don't think I'll ever get this perfected, but I'm steadily working on it. <laughs> I think the other thing is too that um, someone that doesn't have a lot of knowledge, not necessarily an experienced person, um, I think the priority is there is – who can I go to to get the most experience that I can use as a, a basis to use as a stepping stone almost for a, a long-term career with horses? It's not always the one who's going to be paying the most because I think that what you can learn, you know, just going to someone for 12 months, two years, it's just, it's invaluable. And money, there's no money that can explain it. You can't just go to someone because they pay more you want to go to the person that you're going to learn the most from and get the most experience from and and um you know as you say someone that you already can align with someone that you can work with and you know 12 months two years you might then go on and work with someone else but it's that first initial person i think very important yeah and i think if your person can go ideally to a place that has a variety of horses i think that's a big big thing like, in a way, I know everybody's first thought is they'd love to go to the barn where the coach is always winning the world championships or something like that. And uh, on the one hand, that is really good. On the other hand, in a way, if you go to a few places where you have to ride the horses that are just a little bit rougher, or a little bit tougher, or have a little bit more problems, if you can learn how to train that type, I think it's then easier to round off and... Uh, kind of polish off your program. Um, if you make a point of starting out with horses that are push button and everything is perfect, I don't know sometimes if a person in that position has as good a training base. Because if you go out on your own as a trainer, you're not going to be given those amazing horses in most place, in most cases. Like you're going to have to start off with the ones that are a little farther down. So again, this is maybe where a person should maybe go to a few trainers. I may be already changing my story from what I told you a second ago, but I do think you want to go to a place where you get sort of a cross-section because, and again, where you mentioned um, a person wouldn't get paid as much at one place versus another. In the royal scheme of things, probably as an assistant trainer, you're not going to get paid very well anywhere. So uh, you probably might as well go to the place where you're going to learn the most because that little bit of a difference in money, I don't know that that would pay off in the long term getting that slight little bit more because it, it, that you're going to factor that in throughout. What you learn there is going to be spread out throughout your entire career. So, yes, I think you're definitely right. Wherever you learn the most is the place you need to go to. Yep, yep. What about, you know, like there's lots of people in the horse industry, you know, lots of lots of trainers or would-be trainers, lots of people who do it full-time and travel and, you know, they're all clinicians and professionals. Then you get some that might do it a bit part-time or just can't make a, any money out of it or, you know, like there's, there's quite a lot of 
variety within someone being a trainer? What makes someone better? What do the top trainers and specialists and clinicians have above the others, do you think, you know, as horse people, to make them so that they get better? What's different about them and someone who, say, starts off being a trainer and says, oh, no, I'm I'm not doing any good. I can't make it in the horse industry. What makes the top ones better? Well, there's probably a million ways to answer that. Just from looking at other clinicians and other trainers and the people that I consider very successful, they're really they're really people that, I don't know if I want to use the word obsessed, but almost maybe that is the word to use. They just want to know a little bit more about horses. They just always want another tip. They always want another hint. They're really, they eat, sleep, and breathe horses. And to me, if a person doesn't eat, sleep, and breathe horses. I don't really think they should do this. I think that they, I think they should definitely be involved in horses and that, but I think they'd be far better off in a lot of cases anyway, to have a good job and then have horses as their fun and their, and uh, enjoy them and that type of thing. But if you're going to try to do it in the business, I think if you, they don't, I think if nearly every minute of every day, if you're not thinking about horses in some way or another, I would say probably it's not the industry for you. And uh, the clinicians that I have seen that I would consider the most successful ones, they're really that way. They're always trying to learn something new about horses. Another thing is being decent with people. And like most clinicians will be slightly better with people or slightly better with horses, but the good ones are pretty, at least pretty good with both. And uh, so I've met horse trainers that, uh, yeah, I've met horse trainers that were, um, were very, very good horse trainers, but they really were not good with people. And they would never really do what I would consider real well as a clinician. Like they just, if you can't relate to people and can't get your points across, then it's almost kind of a waste of time. You could still go out and be a very good trainer, but I would kind of say, well, stay in the clinician realm because at the end of the day, as a clinician, you're dealing with people a lot more than you're dealing with the horses. Because as a clinician, you're not the one getting on all those horses in the clinics. You're telling the people what to do so that they can get along. So you're communicating with the people and then hoping they communicate properly with the horses. So it's, it's more of a people business than it is a horse business. But at the same time, if you don't have that good, strong horse background, I think as a clinician, again, it's just going to stop at a certain point. Like the horsemanship still has to be there. So I guess... I give you a really long-winded answer, and I guess at the end of the day, my answer is a person has to have a pretty good balance uh, between being good with the folks and being good with the horses. Yeah, I, th- I think well answered, and I think very relevant too. But you now, you know, as a top clinician and, you know, someone you've gone out now and you're, you're co-hosting, and, and I thought one show, but obviously it's sort of to do with two different channels, so it's almost like two different shows. And now I'm going to say the biggest challenge. Now, everyone's got money as a challenge. You know, that's not that's not going to be a good answer because it's too common. But what's been your biggest challenge on your way to being where you are now? You know, think about, right, what have I done? What um, challenges have I overcome to actually get here? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. And there's probably a lot of different ways I could answer it. Um, well, the answers you've given so far have been pretty good. So, so you know, just keep answering that. I'm enjoying the answers that you've given so far. Well, uh, I'll try to make up another good one then. But, uh, no, I would say one of the big challenges, I don't know if it's the biggest, but one of the big ones has been where we're located. It's a really nice area and there's, there's lots of horses and lots of good people, but it's not really the heart of horse country, at least in the Western realm. So one thing that's been a little bit tricky for us, like when we've tried to expand into the bigger places, we didn't have all the connections to get us there. And so like, for instance, we don't, um, I couldn't pick up the phone and call somebody that uh, is a family friend that could get us into a big horse expo or something like that. So all of our, all of our connections, we sort of had to do it all the hard way and uh, we had to push pretty well. Um, we started like in the expo and event world, we started with pretty small ones and then, uh, ran around and did quite a few of them. And then you kind of work your way up to the medium sized ones and then the big ones from there. 
So I would say being out of the loop a little bit and then trying to find a path in was, if not our biggest challenge, it was definitely one of the biggest challenges. Uh, one thing I used to do was I would enter in these, uh, and I think you have a few of them in Australia, these cold starting competitions, and they would sometimes be held at big events. And I would go there and I would be in one of those. And it sort of gave us an opportunity to meet the folks that put on events and kind of meet the other clinicians and things like that. So it was almost like a little bit of an indirect route to it. And then, uh, then you kind of get to know everybody and then expand out from there. And then it's gone really well for us. So in some areas it's, we've had some good breaks and other areas it's been really, really tough. Um, but at the same time, kind of looking back on it, I wouldn't change any of it. It's worked out the way I would have liked it to. It worked out basically the way I wanted it to. It just went maybe very many indirect ways to get there. So say you're going out to do a clinic. You you know, people that you don't know, horses that you don't know, they're just a open slate sort of thing. What's the most common fault that you see with the riders or the trainers or the handlers, you know, and how can you fix it? You know, what do you then do? to come in and um, and fix that fault? There's a few of them. Um, one of the ones I would say shows up the most, well, one is horses that are a little bit too, uh, I don't want to use the term spoiled, but they don't have good enough manners. So if the horse is constantly pushing the owner around on the ground or kind of just going wherever they want to go under saddle, it makes it just a little bit tricky because even if you get the person doing the right thing, the horse still isn't listening because the horse already kind of knows they don't have to listen to that person, or at least they think they don't have to listen. So that is something that shows up an awful lot. So sometimes in the clinics, I'll be constantly uh, trying to get folks to firm up a little bit or get the point across just a little bit more. And I sometimes I feel like it's a little bit misleading of, about the way I train because actually I would consider myself a fairly mild and maybe softer trainer than a lot of them are. But at the same time, when the horses are pushy and don't really have any manners, sometimes you do have to toughen up a little bit in the beginning just to sort of set, get a little bit of manners and then you can go ahead and go back to being soft and be gentle and get everything done nicely. Um, not that we don't do it nicely anyways, but that's uh, one part of it. Another part, and it's probably the hardest thing to teach, is uh, getting a person to have feel for their horse. So a lot of times you will see a person do something with their horse, and their horse does it correctly or at least tries to do it correctly, and the owner doesn't reward them for that. And then the horse kind of gets flustered and gives up on them or just doesn't try very hard the next time. So getting people to recognize when the horse is giving them some effort and kind of getting them to back off when things are going the right way, I think is something that's hard to explain to people. And it's even harder for to get people to, to recognize it. And that, but once they do start to recognize it a little bit, you'll very often see the person suddenly they're so happy because they realize things are actually much easier than they realized. They thought they had to maybe be do a bunch more work or be firmer or do all these different things. And actually they need to do less, not more. And that, and that's almost, um, you'll see sort of the light bulb go on a little bit and like, oh man, I've made the part of myself. It was right here all along. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's that timing too. It's not just watching a video, you know, this is a video earlier today, see where you've missed it, but it's the timing to be able to give that, you know, that we reward or release straight away immediately rather than, you know, a circle or two circles later even. It's difficult developing it because it's almost too late by the time you see it. You know, you're watching them, you see it, you recognize it, then you say, reward that. Then the person thinks, what well, What did you say? What did you say? And then they might give a bit of a token reward. It's, it's, it's almost not quick enough then. It's just got to be so quick and so immediate for the horse to get the most benefit from it. That's very, very true. And one thing that I sometimes point out to people is, by the time I've critiqued you, it's already too late. Just keep this in mind for the next time. And that because there's not, I'm not going to get the point across. Sometimes if they have made the same mistake a few times, I'll sort of uh, warn them a little bit. And then I'll be like, okay, release now. Like, and that's about the only way that I can set up the timing to, to do that. But yes, you're absolutely right. By the time you've told somebody something, 
the opportunity is gone. It's just so they know for the next time and the next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us about the show, The Horse Trainers. When does it get released? When is it, you know, like we're, we're sort of talking about 2021, but when? You know, give us a bit more information. Um, early 2021. I don't have an exact release date yet, but it's basically the very beginning of the year. Um, we're doing quite a few different topics. Uh, there's a three-part series in there on cult starting. There's um, a lot of it's actually fairly common little issues and problems that folks have, like uh, horses that have a few bad habits or um, green horses that don't, that need to know just a little bit more. And putting it on as well, like here's how to get your horse softer and here's how to get your horse moving off like better and start side passing. And, uh, and then we threw a few little extras in there. Like uh, I believe one episode is uh, working with draft horses under saddle. And there's a few little specific ones sort of like that, that we just kind of put in the mix just so there'd be sort of a bit of a variety for everybody. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Bronwyn's doing a few episodes. Well, not a few. She's doing about half a dozen on like barrel racing and pole bending and things like that. Uh, so we have quite a cross section. And now if I hadn't one plan that we had wanted to do, and we didn't get a chance to do it, unfortunately, in this one is we wanted to, uh, film at more of the clinics and the horse expos and things like that, and then mix that into the show. But then of course, COVID showed up. And then uh, a lot of those events got canceled or postponed and stuff. So we didn't get a chance to get that type of footage into the episodes. So if we can get this together for another year, we're going to try to have a little more of that for the following season if all goes to plan. Yep, yep. Well, that'll be wonderful. I think we just need to uh, stay in touch as soon as you've got those dates because so the way we do it is every episode or every chat that we have, we have a new page and then at the bottom of each page, we can put your details. So people just need to go to horsechats.com, search for Jason or search for Erwin, and um, that'll come up episode. And then at the bottom of any episode, you know, now and any in the future that you do, we'll have all those details and um, we'll be able to put in, you know, the links to the Cowboy Channel and exactly, you know, where it is and when it starts and, you know, if it's already on. Um, so we just need to stay in touch here, Jason, so we can tell everyone about it. So, um, you know, I'd love to have you back on. I'm sure that we could even do a few episodes where you say, right, we're going to do, this is how you do this. And just sort of talk us through different areas, you know, different things that you're training where you might do a, um, a particular program about something and then, or a particular show about something. And then someone hears you on a chat and says, right, I, I need to go and listen to that show that is about this. So if you're happy to come back on, it'd be wonderful. We'd be very grateful to have you back on. Oh, I'd love to do it. That'd be a lot of fun. I think it'd be really good for the listeners too, I think, um, and certainly we'll lead them through to the Cowboy Channel and the other channel that you talked about. So, Jason, just um, anything else? You know, we've talked about doing that, but you've almost done all the work for that now. So now as things get, well, hopefully back on track, you know, hopefully there's a vaccine and back on track and, you know, if we can ever get back to normality or the new normal or whatever it is and, um, you know, you're able to do more clinics and do the filming then, where do you plan to go? You've said that you're doing quite a lot in Canada and the US. Um are you thinking about coming to Australia? Are you thinking about going to other countries? What are your plans? Yes, well, no, we'd absolutely love to go to Australia. That's uh, one of the things that we've always had in the back of our mind. Uh, one of the things was also Brown has made me watch every episode of McLeod's Daughters about three times. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're like, you need to be down there at some point or another. We all have to listen to, to every episode of Heartland as well. So, you know... <laughs> Good oh, TV okay. productions, <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> we kind of know where each other are coming from on this one. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Have you contacted Equitana about the way of the horse? Uh, I talked to them a couple of years ago about something, but they had already uh, had folks in there at the time. It had already been booked, I believe, if I'm remembering that correctly. And then uh, last two, I was thinking about contacting them, I think the last one or two years, I forget which, and then uh, we had other events booked at the exact same time that were a little bit closer to home that we that we knew we had to be at. So uh, our schedules have been a little bit fu funny here. So I just I knew I couldn't do it, so I never got a uh, hold of them. Uh, but you know, no, for sure, we'd love to get down there at some point or another. Um, I'd love to see. Obviously, everybody in the world would, but I'd love to see COVID go away and 
obviously horse things get back on track. Uh, Canada has obviously been our, our biggest thing in the U S we seem to be, uh, growing there as we go along. We were supposed to be at a big expo in California here in the spring. Then it got postponed. Then of course it got canceled, but then we're booked to go down there uh, next year. And then we have some other big horse expos in Western Canada that we're booked in for this coming year. And, uh, I guess we'll have to try to figure a way to get to Australia. We need we need to get there. Yeah, Australia or New Zealand. I'm sure that you'll um you'll love to come to either either one of those Equitanas. Oh, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> Jason, great to talk to you, and um, I'm sure we'll catch up soon. And um, yeah, just thanks again. Bye bye. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. If you've enjoyed this chat, then. Please-